This video is dedicated to the memory of Dave Smith, who led the development of MIDI, a standard interface protocol for synchronizing electronic instruments and audio equipment, which had just revolutionized the music industry and uh, opened up the creativity to millions of people. And it's also interesting that he created the first polyphonic synthesizer with fully programmable memory. So in 1981, Smith set out to create a standard protocol for communication between electronic musical instruments from different manufacturers worldwide. So standardization is necessary, but also um, independent creativity as well. So here is an example of a synthesizer being controlled by MIDI software. So what makes that possible? This, the MIDI 1.0 specification from 1980. And this is the electrical circuit that is required in order to drive it. And this is the computer codes that are sent across the MIDI interface from the computer to the synthesizer and back. So it's really a communication protocol between two computers because inside the synthesizer is computer code. And the meaning of life is 42. That was deep thought. But the code that printed 42 is not just a print 42. Look at that. It's a remark statement with gobbledygook followed by uh, 200 numbers. And then the 2 says go to 100. And then this is how the gobbledygook was entered, a hex entry. And then let's see, list 15, 16, okay. And 16 allows you to verify. And then 100 says print user 16514. So how does all that print uh, 42? Well, let's run it at 16 and look at what it did, okay. So the hex code in the beginning of the program is this. 60E2AC9. And then we got to look it all up in this user manual to see what those codes are. So let's find uh, the nice handy dandy chart right here and look up 06. So here is 4 down here and let's go to 6. It's a nice little graphic, but it's a Z80 assembler instruction that says load the B register with a number. So we're loading the B register with the next byte, which is a zero. Now we have a zero E. Where is the zero E? Here it is. It says load the C register with a number. And the next byte is a 2A. So what is a 2A? That's 2 times 16 plus 10, so that's 32 plus 10, and there's your number 42. And then the C9, if you look it up here, uh, next page. Okay, so memorize all these instructions and the byte codes for them. And C9, here it is, um, RET. What do you think that means? Return. Wow. Now let's uh, run it again. So it's doing that go to 100. Let's list 100. Okay. And that says print user 16514. Where is that number coming from? Well, then you have to understand a little bit more about the architecture of this computer. System variables. So in memory, in your wonderful 2K of memory, you have variables starting at 16384 and going through 16507, which is not used for two bytes. 
So that's a 16508. 09 is the start of your basic program, and it gives a program here for showing that. And um, let's list this thing again. Okay, and so the program starts at 16509, then it has the number one and a remark statement, and then the gobbledygook. Well, that gobbledygook was that machine language program. So now we have to understand how programs are stored in memory, and that's where these diagrams come in. So at 16509, we have um, here. Okay, so that's the architecture. And here we have two bytes for the line number, then we have the length, and then we have the first instruction. So 16509, 10, 11, 12, and then we have a 13. Well, the 13 would be the remark statement, so 16514 would be the start of our machine language code. And let's check that out. 100. 16514, and that's what calls the machine language routine, which just magically prints the number 42. So you're seeing now there is no magic. It is all logic. It's those chips inside that are they're collaborating with each other to execute basic programs and machine language code. But it all comes down to machine language code. And thanks to Clive Sinclair for making it so easy to understand. So now you understand the meaning of life. Well, this is a real uh, life simulation program that we'll look at. So when you're coding for the um, Timex Sinclair, it's advisable to use two tapes and alternate between them and keep track of what you're putting on each tape. So these two tapes, the first two are identical, and the third one has a ZX Life program, uh, which I can then uh, tune, test, and copy to the other tape. So then I know where I am and what I'm doing, so I keep swapping between these tapes. Loading, 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 loading little doggies. So why are we seeing these bars? Because the Timex Sinclair cannot use the video display while it is um, operating the code to read from the tape. And we just read a program successfully from tape. So let's list it. That's the K key, obviously. And it has a remark statement with uh, a lot of other stuff. More gobbledygook. So now let's list at line two, okay, and see some logic in this program. Hello, focus, yeah. So two says go to 100, and three is uh, for entering the hex, and 16 is for reviewing the hex. Now let's uh, list at 22, okay, and so here's that 100. It randomizes and then calls user 16522, and it randomizes and calls user 16562. Well, here are those numbers that were determined when I entered the program. And uh, let's look at that code. So let's run 16. Okay, so at 16514, which is the first byte after the remark statement, there is a table of, I think, eight bytes. And then um, at 16522, that's the start of the program. So that is the start of the machine code. And to understand where this machine code comes from, it was typed in from a book, which I'm going to show you next. On archive.org, you can find this book, Mastering Machine Code on Your ZX81 by Tony Baker. And here is the URL, Mastering Machine 0000 Bake. Okay, and there are details, and uh, we can check out this book for an hour. Okay, and then let's look inside it. So it has illustrations by Kathy Lowe. So these two women did a great job in 1981 of teaching people how to use um, machine code on the ZX81. 
And let's see, if we magnify this a little bit, there's a preface from a Timex Sinclair user group, actually a ZX81 user group in England, um, National ZX80 and X81 Users Club, August 1981. And then uh, looking at this table of contents, you could see it is very, very technical. So these women knew their stuff and they knew how to introduce the concepts step-by-step step to people who wanted to learn machine language. So let's uh, honor them for their contribution to the industry because the people who worked on this machine had to struggle and use tapes and uh, they are now uh, really sophisticated programmers. So let's also acknowledge Brewster Kale and his foundation um, for digitizing this book this year, making it available to people like me. Okay, and uh, let's look at the table of contents and find the meaning of life. Okay, uh, so that uh, program that printed the number 42 actually came from this book. And let's see down here, we have um, A Touch of Culture, page 109. So here, the author actually talks about Conway's game of life and how to code it on a um, Timex uh, uh, ZX81. So this is the source code that we looked at on the computer. So this is the table and this is the actual machine instructions and this takes some time to understand and follow and debug to get it working on your ZX81 or Timex Sinclair. So you can name the programs and the name gets stored on the tape. So then when you load it, you could just leave the tape playing and it'll skip over any programs that are not named with that name. So any second now you'll see the first program load and it's going to load and then skip over that because the name is wrong then it'll load the second and eventually it'll get to the third so thank you uh, for that convenience so you don't have to really fast forward to the tape counter for that uh, program okay that program that tape just finished loading and this is our beautiful machine language code into in a remark statement so now if i type uh Whoops, I typed the wrong key. I have to click Shift-0 to delete. Okay, now let's type uh, list2 to see anything after line 1. And here is the simple program that doesn't have any of the other code. So let's run that and pray. And eventually, the first time doesn't seem to work. So what I do is break it with the Shift-Space uh, button and run it again and it displays a random pattern of cells to be used as the starting point for the game of life. So it's not actually working yet because I have to further debug. There may be actually a bug in the printed code, so I have to compare every instruction uh, to the uh, values in this manual and see if there's anything not matching. So that is the hours of fun that you could have with a Timex Sinclair. And if you want even more fun, get a ZX81 with only 1K of memory where uh, you run out of it so fast. Okay, so um, we've seen that machine code is the meaning of life and life is the meaning of life. But I've come to the conclusion these days that music is the meaning of life. Okay, so what are we looking at? We are looking at a 2 plus with integer ROMs that just booted up. And this is how Apple's booted in the old days of since 1977 that had the integer ROM, the non auto start ROM. That F is created by the keyboard encoder, but uh, that's okay. It's just a side effect. But then you have this star prompt and you are in the Apple monitor. And in order to boot a floppy disk drive, you have to type 6 control P. Or you could go into your integer basic and type PR number 6. And now we're booting a floppy disk, which I, a brand new floppy disk created in 2022 that will get archived for Kansas Fest. 
And I'm going to run Susan after Andre Susan, an interesting person to look up um, in the Apple community. He was a product manager for Europe, selling apples all over Europe. But he wrote this program, and he uh, it is a music program. And it's actually a Chopin waltz that it's playing. Just listen to it a little bit. So one fascinating fact is that the Apple computer helped me learn to appreciate classical music because the thrill that I had when I first downloaded a, a basic program over a 300 baud modem and ran it and it played music. It was um, a Bach partita for violin. And look how nice this was done. Wait a minute, was that beep part of the music? <laughs> That's the Apple beep. And if I blind type C051, we'll see that the machine crashed at C702 because it's trying to boot a floppy drive in slot seven or whatever the old monitor Apple IIs did in the day. So the computer I started learning on was an unenhanced Apple IIe. And I'm booting up this one and I have to flip my monitor switch and Electronic Arts, Will Harvey's Music Construction Set. This is what allowed Mu Will Harvey to get into the software industry because this program was picked up by Electronic Arts. And let's hear a sample song in its demo. <laughs> Okay, you didn't see the screen, but this is um, the uh, Bank Street Music Writer software from the Bank Street College of Education, 1987. So before I had piano lessons, it was difficult for me to imagine how printed music sounded on a page. So Bank Street Music Writer let me type in the music to a multi-part piece and hear it on the mockingboard, for example. Oh, Danny boy. This arrangement came from a high school music teacher who um, had a recorder consort, and that's where I learned to play the tenor recorder, which has a beautiful sound. So he jazzed up Irish air, and this is in his memory. even jazzier. And those eighth notes should have been swung. Okay, I'm gonna stop it. That was Jared. And that is five-bit audio. 
and you're going to hear my mockingbird music. Okay, what we have here is um, the right AY chip of the mocking board replaced with a YM284 connected to a clock circuit uh, that generates a 2 megahertz pulse from uh, this card here by taking the phase 1 and doubling it using a comparator and an exclusive or phase lock circuit. So now let's test out the mocking board demo disc. Okay, it found the 6522. So left speaker is the YM chip. So the interrupt routine is giving it problems, it's um, hitting it too fast. Now hear the difference. So the explosion was fine. So things that do a lot of interrupts will probably not work, but maybe most of the software will. We'll have to test some more titles with this. So let's test the sound effects. Okay, gunshot on the left and on the right. Machine gun. Yeah, that's good because the train is where we had problems. It was, now it's the correct speed, helicopter. good. Now, when I go to the keyboard, what I discover is that I guess the Mockingboard is configured to have the left channel an octave higher, because comparing... Okay, that's the initial thing. So if I play left channel and then right channel, so the right channel is an octave lower, because if I bump up the if you listen to this and then I bump up the octave those match on pitch and that is how I how the mocking board actually works and it works fine
So you get all six um, tones and the noise period one play. Okay, I leave it at nine and uh, I have to press something. Okay. Let's do this one and four. working. Now try noise period of 15. Okay, and a noise period of 31. Okay, and uh, let's try the shape of 8 which is a repeating pattern. Yep, that's working. Okay, and then we could go back to tone by setting noise of zero. You should hear the tone repeat. Okay, now the way I discovered the octave difference, I went all the way up to octave nine, and I discovered on the right channel, you get three notes on the left channel, you just get the highest note. Oh, we got the envelope shape repeating. Okay, let's put that back to nine. All right. Okay, so for two and three, you don't get anything, you just get a little clicking. Which mean which is correct if uh, nine is the ho highest octave, and um, that C is that. So let's go down an octave to eight, and that should match the right speaker on octave nine, and it does. Let's go down to the bottom octave. So apparently that's too much. Let's go to octave three. And it's out of tune a little. Okay, maybe let's try, oh, an octave three. And if I go octave two, yeah, it may be out of tune a little bit. using a um, 100 ohm resistor and a 33 pico farad capacitor based on the formula in the data sheet to get the two megahertz. I don't know if any other further tuning can be done with better resistors, but I think this is what you're going to get. So it's not perfect, but it will work for most cases. Okay, um, this is a mopping board test using the 7 megahertz line to uh, be the clock source for the YMZ uh, chip, the Yamaha chip, and here are the results. So we are getting results. Um, it's just fast, so we need to divide that 7 megahertz by 2 or 4 and see yeah, if we could tune the uh, music. So here, when we uh, play music, um, you'll hear that it's off on the left speaker, which is what we're testing. Okay, and then um, you could hear it in the tuning of the notes on the keyboard. Yep. So um, this is a C, and then this is the equivalent at 7 megahertz. All right, so it's off. E. Yeah, 
they're logically relative to each other. Okay, and the noise is also shortened. So if I do noise one and uh, play, yep, and then noise 31. Okay, so we got to find the right clock speed using uh, an existing Apple source. I tried the Q3, but that's asymmetrical, so it didn't work for some reason. Okay. So my Slackfest project for Kansas Fest 2022 involves using an Arduino to filter MIDI messages from any uh, playback source in, to and send them out to an Apple IIe or 2GS that has a MIDI interface. So the MIDI interface that av was available is um, a Passport compatible MIDI interface. And the Apple IIgs supports an Apple MIDI interface, which is hard to find these days. But see, the iPad had a camera connection kit, which can actually be connected by a USB to a MIDI interface, which is that blue item. And um, it can send MIDI data to a synthesizer or any computer. So um, the songs are loaded using iTunes. So this is the MIDI in circuit. And MIDI in always uses an opto isolator to electrically isolate the current from the synthesizer or the computer that's going into the circuit. So the circuit goes into the Arduino. It's a serial interface. And then um, with the Arduino, you could also hook up switches. Uh, you could hook up potentiometers and all kinds of stuff which can be used to control it. And uh, what I'm just showing here is um, the connection, but you, you can hook up a um, SD card uh, data logger shield and a keypad shield to have a visual display. And then it would be possible to have a menu system written in software that can control the configuration of your MIDI system. Like say you want to mute uh, certain channels or you want to filter out the drums, you could save different configurations on the SD card. And then um, this is the MIDI output. So the one of the uh, transmit serial interfaces would go out to a MIDI out port. And I also want to do a MIDI through box so that I can have multiple MIDI ports um, with taking the information, sending it out, and uh, this uh, header it would um, allow me to plug in additional MIDI sockets. And um, the resistor is 220 ohms. That's the magic number needed for the current loop for the MIDI interface by the MIDI spec.